Okay, one second. Let me just check that again. Okay, whatever. All right, so here we go. We're starting with chapter eight. Um, and uh, we're starting, we're, we did until now, essentially we had the story of Samuel, the story of his, of his birth, of his early years, and his role as a judge, uh, wonderful things about Samuel. Uh, and then we start in chapter eight, he's already old, okay? And so this is a, towards the end of his life, and we have uh, what's going on here. So chapter eight, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the second son's name was Aviah sat as judges in Beersheba, but his sons did not follow in his ways. They were bent on gain. They accepted bribes and they subverted justice. Reminds us a little bit of Eli, which in a way is very surprising because Samuel was intimately involved with what happened with Eli and his sons. In the case of Eli, who by all intensive purposes was a very righteous man, he was the one who raised up Samuel. He taught him uh, how to love God. Clearly, Eli himself was a righteous man. And yet his sons were the worst uh, that you can imagine in corruption, taking advantage of their privileged position as priests in the tabernacle to extort and to corrupt and all these terrible things that we read about with them. And as a result of that, God came to Eli through Samuel, okay, to tell Eli that he sinned and not trying to stop his sons. And therefore there's this terrible punishment that will be meted out to Eli and his sons. The sons will both die on the same day. The, uh, uh, and, and his, in his, uh, there'll be a terrible catastrophe, which we learn afterwards is this terrible defeat in the war and the Ark is taken and that his line will be cut off. And of course we studied about that as well. Here, however, where we seem to have a similar situation, although don't we don't have that much detail about what Samuel's sons did, but we see that they are accepting bribes and subverting justice. That's pretty bad considering they are judges. So in a way they are, taking advantage of their position as judges for corruption, similar to the way that Eli's sons take advantage of their positions as priests to be corrupt and extort personal gain. Um, however, we don't see any criticism from God to Samuel about this. So that's a question that I have. And as we continue in the story, I think that will come forward as well. We'll come back to that. Okay. All the elders of Israel assembled and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, you have grown old and your sons have not followed your ways. Therefore, appoint a king for us to govern us like all other nations. What we do have is not here at this point a response from God, but we do have a response from the nation, which is also very, very interesting. It seems to me to indicate more than anything else, a very fundamental change that has happened to the nation between the time of Eli or Eli and the time of Samuel. It's not that many years. Okay. Well, by the end of, of Samuel's life, let's say it's been, I don't know, 50 years or something, because let's say it's from the time Samuel was very young, which is the point at which um, Sam, you know, Eli dies and all that happens. This is now the end of Samuel's, towards the end of his life as Samuel is old. So let's say it's 40 years, 50 years, whatever. Um, we have a change in the nation. Whereas under Eli's rule, when the, when the sons of Eli are doing these terrible things, we see the nation suffering, but we don't see them coming to Eli and complaining, demanding, asking. This has to change. We don't want this. You don't see that at all. You get the impression that perhaps the nation feels absolutely powerless. They don't feel they have an address in Eli, which may be part of the problem, which may be part of the reason 
that indeed we don't see God coming up against Samuel and punishing him in the same way he punishes Eli. On the other hand, with Samuel, you can see that the nation feels very comfortable in going to Samuel and complaining. They're saying, we have a problem here. Your sons are not following in your ways. Okay, now they don't say to them, get your sons in order. They put forward a different solution. They said, bring us a king. And that, of course, is something that Samuel doesn't like at all. And we'll get to that shortly. But just to point this issue out, what this means, the difference between Samuel and Eli. And I think the reason for this is what we learned at the end of the last chapter. We learned that Samuel would go from city to city. He didn't wait for the nation to come to him. He went out to make sure he reached areas that were further away and would come to the nation and be their leader. And that's a very, very special kind of leader. Eli stayed in the tabernacle. And so when the people came to the tabernacle and they saw this is how the tabernacle is running and they saw what the sons are doing, they could easily assume that Eli was behind this. So it wasn't just a question of Eli didn't stop at them, but from the perspective of the nation, they had no address. They had no one to turn to because the tabernacle, which is under Eli's you know, responsibility is being a mess and Eli is standing there. There was no other place where the nation could meet Eli. Eli did not wander around the, 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 the country. He didn't create an independent, direct relationship with the nation. In the case of Samuel, he went out. He didn't stay in one place. He went out and was able to create an independent relationship with the nation. And that is also something that we see in the sense that where were his sons? Where were Samuel's sons? They were in Beersheba. Unlike Samuel, who's wandering in different places, the sons are in one place, in Beersheba. And so on the one hand, this can, that maintains that direct relationship between the nation and Samuel, the people in Beersheba are a problem, but they don't interfere with the relationship between the nation and Samuel. On the other hand, we can also say the fact that this is going on in Beersheba means that Samuel really has less control over them. Maybe he has criticized them. We don't know. It doesn't say they did. It doesn't say he didn't. But here's a situation where they are out there in their own fiefdom, so, so to speak. It's very possible there are commentaries who say at this point, because Samuel is old, he's no longer able to travel as extensively as he used to. And therefore, he sends his sons to take care of justice in Beersheba, which is one of the furthest points uh, of Israel at that time. And therefore, it's not just that he's not seeing them, but they've created their own autonomous fiefdom over there. So we have less control over what's going on. And I think, you know, these are some of the things that help me understand perhaps why we don't get the same response from God to Samuel as we got to Eli. Okay, so let's go on. In verse six, um, Samuel was displeased. Okay, he really didn't like the fact that they asked for a king. Samuel was displeased that they said, give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord and the Lord replied to Samuel, heed the demand of the people and everything they say to you, for it is not you that they have rejected, it is me they have rejected as their king. Like everything else they have done ever since I brought them out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and worshiping other gods, so they are doing to you. Heed their demand, but warn them solemnly and tell them about the practices of any king who will rule over them. Okay, so here you have something. There's two questions. Why, why did this bother Samuel so much? And why was it that God said to Samuel, you're not the problem, I am. God is interpreting their request for a king as a sort of rebellion against God. And puts it in line with their lead, you know, their throughout the period of the judges, when they would periodically leave God and go worship uh, idols and things like that. Uh, he is taking this request for a king in the same way. And that in and of itself raises a lot of questions. What, what is it that they were asking for? And what was the problem in what they were asking for? Now, First of all, and let's look carefully at what he says. 
Their main request is give us a king to govern us like other nations. Now, they create, they presented a problem. The problem is you're getting old and your sons are not following your ways. And their solution is give us a king to rule us like other nations. So there are some people that say that, that and, and this kind of connects with the question we asked before, uh, why is it that God didn't respond to Samuel in the same way he did to Eli? What what was going on here? Um, and he and, and the same question we just asked right now, what was so terrible about what they asked? Um, and here they're saying that they use the sons in his excuse. Because if they really, if the sons were really the biggest problem, okay, then they would have said, your sons are a problem. Give us a king or a judge that will judge us fairly, that will judge us, uh, you know, honorably, that will judge us following God's ways, okay? Or they may say, uh, will you please take back the reins, get rid of your sons? We want you to continue judging us for the rest of your life. Those kinds of requests would have made a lot of sense and probably would have gotten anybody upset. I mean, maybe Samuel would have been saddened to understand how badly his sons have done. But the way this is being interpreted, it seems, both by God and by Samuel, is that the issue of the sons is an excuse. Because what are they saying here? We want a king like all the other nations. And that is why God is saying, oh, this is a nation that not just they keep rebelling. The issue of having the king uh, wasn't about rebelling. It was about being like all the other nations. And just like every single time, all the nations, what do they keep doing? They leave God and they go to other gods. Why? Because those are the pagan ways of the nations. It is a problem of imitation. And so in the same way that they were constantly imitating the nations and leaving God and following pagan ways, God is saying it's the same problem. They don't want a king for good reasons. They want a king for bad reasons. They want a king to be like the other nations. Okay. And he basically says, nothing can be done about it. You're going to listen to them. But at the same time, you need to instruct them. And here in my English, as it says, the practices of any king. The word in Hebrew is mishpat hamelech. Mishpat means uh, uh, law, okay? That's it, the same word for law. It's the same word for uh, verdict, okay? In other words, it's a legal issue. It's, I'm going to, you tell them about the legal framework of a king. The legal framework of a king. Basically, what is a king? What does a king do? What are the rules of a king? What does a king do? What is he allowed to do? How does he do? What are the so it's not just the customs of a king, it's the legal jurisdiction or the legal capacity of a king. Okay. Now I think that the use of the word mishpat is also um is also because they are um um uh, it's referring very, very clearly to the it the the um issue of the king, the idea of a commandment of a king that we see in Deuteronomy 17. Now, those of you who studied um, the Torah portions with me a few years ago uh, may remember our discussion of this issue. And I think we also discussed it a little bit in, in the book of Judges when we talked about what is the ideal situation, a king or a judge, or what's the ideal situation. Again, we're facing the same situation. Is a king the ideal situation? Should they have asked for a king? Is there a problem in they asked for a king? Is there a problem in the way they asked for a king? Or is there a problem in the very asking for a king? Is that a problem? So let's go back to Deuteronomy 17 and see what's going on there. Deuteronomy 17, verse 14. If after you have entered the land that the Lord your God has assigned to you and taken possession of it and settled in it, you decide, I will set a king over me as do all the nations about me. You shall be free to set a king over yourself. So basically the way this is set out, on the one hand, 
Verse 15 begins, you, sh- well, it says here, you shall be free to set a king. That's not exactly what it says. What it says is you shall appoint a king. You shall appoint a king. By putting in you shall be free to set a king, the English is actually interpreting. But if we're looking at the literal words, the literal is set, establish a king, anoint a king over you. Question here, and it's a it's a very um, it's a it's a classic uh, debate among the commentators throughout the ages. Is this an absolute commandment to appoint a king, or is it only a commandment to appoint a king, including following all the restrictions that follow? If you want one, and if you're going to want one, you're going to say, I want a king like all the other nations around me. If indeed it's coming from that sort of request, you can get a sense that it's not ideal. You get a sense that it's talking exactly about the sort of situation that Samuel was encountering. It's not a good thing to have a king. They want a king because they want to be like everyone else. And it's something that God says, you know what? It's not such a good thing, but we're going to go along with it. Nothing we can do about it. They want a king, they'll get a king. So that's the big question in chapter 17. Is it that kind of a Samuel situation? Or is it actually a, 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 a requirement, a commandment to appoint a king? And what the first verse 14 is saying is just when is the right time? You have to finish entering the land. You have uh, taken possession, you've settled it. And at the point at which you are ready, then yes, it becomes a commandment to to uh, to appoint a king and we will leave that that's a that's really a debate out there we can really go either way but if we can continue on in that um in that in this vein we have here um we have here a number of things but a number of restrictions but before we do that i want to go back to the beginning of the chapter in the beginning of the chapter in chapter 17, if we start with verse 2, okay, we have a number of situations that lead up to verse 14. Verses 2 to 7, we're essentially talking about a situation where you have people who have sinned, and you need to have a justice system that will judge them on the basis of witnesses, on the basis of testimony, and then there will be execution of punishment. So these first verses, verses 2 through 7, essentially set up a judicial system based on judges, judges in the way we think about it. Now, not the leader judges in in the book of Judges, but the ordinary judges, those who run a justice system and adjudicate problems, okay? In verses 8 through 13, we talk about a situation that I would say is similar to a Supreme Court, okay? If you have a problem that your ordinary judges cannot solve, then you're going to go up to Jerusalem and you're going to go to the priests, the Levites, okay? It doesn't say Jerusalem, it says the point, the place to which I have chosen, you know, but we know that that will be Jerusalem. And you're going to go to the to the priests, the Levites, and to the judge that will be in those days, and then he will make the final decision. And you have a sense there that this is a super level of judges, what will probably be called in the Bai Ching, in the second temple period, will become the Sanhedrin. There's this idea of a Supreme Court that sits in Jerusalem and that takes care of all this, the, this final thing. And then in verse 14, we begin with the idea of a king. And I'm saying this because I'm also reminding you that in the book of Samuel, which we are just learning, that we're going to talk about the law of king, the law of the king. Okay. And I would put forward their thought that the law of the king is not just the rules by which the king uh, has to abide or how the king acts to the people, but that the idea of a king to begin with is part of a judicial system. You have ordinary judges, you have Supreme Court judges, and then you have a king. And a king has to be part of this judicial system. He is bound by laws in the same way that all judges are bound by laws. And I think that is one of the things that sets apart a king of Israel from other kings. So let's now look at the, um, we have a whole list of restrictions, okay? The first one is in verse 15. It is somebody that God will choose. 
Can't just be anyone. In that same verse, it has to be someone from amongst your brothers. It cannot be a king from another nation. It has to be from amongst your brothers. And then we have four specific rules. You cannot have too many horses. And the, the Bible gives us a reason because it might lead you back to Egypt. You cannot have too many women. You cannot have too, and the reason for that is because these women could lead him, the king astray. You can't have too much silver and gold, okay? And you have to, now that becomes a positive uh, commandment, you have to write yourself a safer Torah, a book of the Torah, or at least part of the Torah. He has to write his own Torah scroll and have it with him at all times so that the word of God is with him, okay? Now, the end of this section we have in verse 20 kind of tells you reasoning for all of this. Thus, he will not act haughtily towards his fellows or deviate from the instruction to the right or to the left. He has to, on the one hand, remain a modest person, not be arrogant. And on the other hand, remain steadfast in his obedience of God. Now, if we look at, at uh, this kind of situation, if I take in the middle, there are the four uh, four um, commandments. Let's start though with the four. The first one is a restriction is that God has to select him. Okay. Um, to me, that is a parallel to the final thing that says that he should not stray from the commandment. He needs to understand it is God who has appointed him and that God is therefore his boss. The second thing it has to be from amongst his brothers is a parallel to this conclusion that he should not be arrogant among above uh, from his brother. He shouldn't feel he's better than his brothers. He needs to remember he's not different from his brothers. He's being just one of many in the nation. All the nation are brothers. He has been selected for a particular job, but it doesn't take him out of the category of brothers. And therefore, he has no reason to be arrogant. Now, if we look at the four different restrictions, okay, we have, he shouldn't have more horses because he could go back to Egypt. What is that all about? Egypt for us is slavery. And if we look at uh, the book of Numbers and the book of Exodus, that whole process that the nation of Israel is going through as they go from Egypt to the land of Israel, there are a number of times that they say, oh, we've had it. It's too hard. We want to go back to Egypt. They want to be slaves because they want to have everything easy. Not that life was easy as slaves. They forget how hard they worked, but it's easy in the sense they don't have to take any responsibility for what they're doing or who they are. And so this is very important. The king has to not have too many horses because he needs to make sure that the nation remains responsible, responsible for its actions, not to be like a slave, but to act responsibly. Number two. Not to have too many wives. Who does this remind us of? Solomon. Solomon was a king that did exactly had too many wives. And the exact consequence happened that the Bible here reminds us of. He had too many wives and they strayed us. We have in, in, in the, you know, later on in, in the book of First Kings, we, we learned that there, were, there was pagan worship going on in the palace of Solomon. Because all these wives brought in their pagan gods. Not to have too much money. What will happen if he has too much money? Okay. To me, what this is telling us, too much money, is exactly the issues that we are going to be dealing with here in Samuel's instruction to the nation. What happens with you have a king? All of them, or many of them, relate to this. They need money. They want money. They want more money. Can't get enough money. Also relates to that. So let's keep that in context. And finally, finally, that he needs to write a Torah that is not a negative, but a positive thing. Of course, that in and of itself is, is seen to be a safeguard. If he has the Torah scroll, it's with him, okay, at all times. That's supposed to safeguarding him from doing all these stuff he's not supposed to do. Okay, so now let's go back to what Samuel is actually going to tell the nation about the problem with the king. Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king. And he said, this will be, again, you have the practice of the king. This is the law of the king. And there, by the way, is a debate. Are these actions that Samuel refers to, are these permitted to a king or not permitted to a king? And there's a debate about that as well. Either that these are perfectly, this is permitted to a king. 
But is that good for the nation? Who knows? Okay, so let's read what it says. He will take your sons and appoint them as his charioteers and horsemen, and they will serve as outrunners for his chariots. He will appoint them as his chiefs of thousands and of fifties, or they will have to plow his fields, reap his harvest, make his weapons and the equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters as perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will seize your choice fields, vineyards, and olive groves, and give them to his courtiers. He will take a tenth part of your grain and vintage to give it to his eunuchs and courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves, your choice young men, and your asses, and put them to work for him. He will take a tenth part of your flocks and you shall become his slaves the day will come when you cry out because of the kingdom you yourselves have chosen and the lord will not answer you on that day everything that he talks about here is about a king who is either arrogant or wants money power okay this is a king who is not and again this is the other side some people say he's allowed to do these things others will say no these are corruptions this is kings who are acting corruptly the truth of it is, I can see it either way. We know, for example, that it is perfectly legitimate for a king to tax his people. And what we see later on, uh, David and Solomon, as they act as a king, there's something called mas ove, a working tax. And what that is, is not money, but it is conscription. But it's not just conscription of people for an army. It's conscription of people to do all the tasks of the of the government of whatever and so this is what he's talking about here taking people to serve him and fulfill all the government positions taking a tax uh in order to to uh, fill his coffers or to just do the work of of a uh of what a government needs to do and i think the 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 transition from 17 to 18 is the transition from doing these things in a minimal way to the extent that is actually needed by a king in a country, government, and doing it in such a way that the people feel burdened and they cry out because of the king whom yourselves have chosen. And again, if we look at Solomon, this is exactly what happened. Okay, Solomon began with taxing people to build his palace, to build the temple. All that is good. By the end of his life, and we learn this at the very end, when Rehoboam takes over and Jeroboam leads a a, 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 a rebellion against them. What is there saying? The, the, the burden of taxation and conscription is way too much. They are, they are just, they're, they, they, they are suffering under this enormous burden. Something went wrong. It's the same Solomon who had his wives and like money and all that stuff. Something went wrong. He started out good and something went wrong. And so that is exactly the kind of scenario that Samuel is painting for the people. Do you really want a king? And of course, at the end, they don't listen to him. They say, no, we want a king. And here, though, that you can read the final answer of the nation in a way that you can interpret it also, though, as being a sort of calming down of their request. Um, so it still says we, we want a king because we want to be like the other nations. But then he says as follows, that she should rule, our king should rule us and go out at our head and fight our battles, okay? And it could be, it's actually not rule us. It says the word shvatenu, judge us, okay? And there's commentaries that say they're not, they're looking for a king, yes, to replace who Samuel is old and his sons are not, um, are not doing what they should be doing. And therefore they want a king who will judge them, who will act as a judge, okay? But, and here, this is an interpretation. You can accept it or not. We, these commentators are saying, judge us based on the rule of God. We want a king to do right by us with justice, and we want him to go out and fight our wars, which is not a role that Samuel ever took. He wasn't a general. He was a prophet. He was a judge. He wasn't a general. And then... Samuel heard all they said, reported it to God, and the God said, listen to them, appoint a king, and Samuel sent them all home. And of course, next week, we're going to start the story of how they find the king and who he was and all that. I think if you look at this chapter, there are a number of different ways to see it. Was Samuel justified in his hurt and his being upset 
Did indeed the nation start out asking for a king in an inappropriate way with perhaps ulterior motives and then adjusted what they were looking for in a king so that it made more sense to Samuel so that they kind of, you know, quieted him down. Probably a little bit of both is going on throughout here because after all, they're human beings and human beings are never black and white. They want a king, they want to be like everyone else, but they also want a king to give stability and to make sure that God's rule is there. And it's going to always be that tension. Every king we're going to see, there's going to be that tension between a successful leader who guides the people, who just who judges them, who is the representative of God's word and just and 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 doing this in a in a in a righteous way, but there's always going to be that influence that giving him in any case a king has a lot of power. In any case, a king has a lot of money. In any case, a king has the potential for corruption. And there isn't a king of Israel who doesn't fall at some point through these ways some more seriously than others. So no matter how you cut it, a human leader is always going to be dancing between these two polar uh, opposites. The, on the one hand, the corruption, the too much power. On the other hand, using that power for the good of Israel and, and, and leading them in a right way. So that is what I have to say for today. Any comments? I do, I have a comment. Um, would you say that God punished Eli's sons severely because they were instrumental in drawing the people away from him because their behavior was a religious aspect, but Samuel's life is a political life? Well, no, Samuel's sons were not political. He was he was no, but his role, taking, his role in the society was more political. No, it was more judicial, not political. Judicial, yeah. It was judicial. And that's that's a very, very serious, it is betraying the trust of the people. If two people come before a judge and are looking for adjudication, and the judge takes a bribe and therefore judges based upon who's giving him more money, that is a betrayal of the trust of the nation. And I think it's a very similar sin to what the sons of Eli did. These people were coming to the tabernacle and they trust the priests to be their intermediaries, to help them with their sacrifices, to help them get closer to God. And instead, the Eli's sons betray their trust. So I think in that sense, they are very, very similar. Uh, perhaps um, because Eli's sons are directly involved as representatives of God, maybe that's right. like what you're aiming at, then yeah. that betrayal of their trust reflects perhaps more on how they would see God, prayer, and all that. Whereas Samuel betraying their trust, Samuel's sons betraying their trust, reflect more on their failings as human beings uh, as yeah. opposed to a failure of God. So you yeah. said it well. You said yeah, it well. That's how yeah. I would define it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? I do, just we want, know, do we know whose um, Samuel's wife was, or we don't have any record of it? Yeah, it doesn't say. There's no mention. I, I have not checked. I wonder if that would be in Book of Chronicles. Um, and then um, the other comment I have is Hannah being such a faithful woman and having a relationship so deeply with God. I don't know if as a grandparent didn't get involved with Samuel's sons. <laughs> we just don't have information on that kind of thing. And we also, they're not living in the same place. Samuel is in Ramah and Elkanah is in Sofim Ramatayim. Sofim Ramatayim is in Ephraim, in the Mount of Ephraim, and Ramah is in Benjamin. So they're not, they don't live together. And I'm sure they visited, you know, for as long as Hannah is alive. We don't know how long she's alive, as opposed to these kids who are, well, by the time they're adults, it could be Hannah's no longer alive. We don't know. It's just not yeah. any information. Yeah, I'm just it. trying to construct the thought that Elkanah being a devout follower, you know, just, they just came from such a strong faith in God. Well, that's where Samuel's coming from. I think Samuel's right, exactly. influences came from his parents, came from Eli. Mm -hmm. Now, clearly, Eli was far more successful with Samuel than he was with his own sons. Yeah, so that's, that's possible also, to know, me, uh, having such a um, 
strong family record and belief system and all the miracles that those children of Samuel's did not make it correctly or right. Okay, now I'm going to tell you something about children of rabbis. I have a feeling you'll see this children of pastors as well. Very often, people who are leaders and are very devoted to their congregation, to their people, whatever, it is very often the family that pays a price. Mm. How many of you know rabbis or pastors whose children are not following in their ways? They're all over the place. Now, sometimes it's just for a short time. Sometimes it's a rebellion and they come back, okay? But very often a pastor or a rabbi who's so involved with the with the community has far less time mm. to spend in educating his own children. Yeah. And if you look in the Bible, who were Moses' sons? Nobodies. They never went, they, they, they're nobody. They have no leadership role. And, and, and in fact, when we studied the story of the of the uh, idol of Micah, we saw there that one of the people in that role, in this priest or whatever, may well have been uh, Gershom himself, one of Moses' sons. That's one of the uh, um, Midrash, one of the traditions, okay, which may or may not be true. But this all goes to show that nobody thought very highly of Moses' sons. And certainly they're not mentioned in any kind of capacity. Um, so this is not something that always happens, but it is something that happens. You can't say Moses was, was not righteous, but Moses was so involved with being a leader of the people. He's not spending any time with his family. In fact, when he goes back to Egypt, you know, at some point, his wife, Tipara and the two kids go back to, to Jethro. He brings them afterwards. He didn't even, there's not even an indication that he sent for them. Jethro comes here. I have your children. Moses is oh, okay. You know, it, it, there, that, and that happens. That happens. I'm just wondering if God actually wanted a leader of some sort or not. In other words, would he give, <laughs> we don't know God's mind, but did he want somebody to bear responsibility for the nation in the form of a king or a leader, or that he should actually be that leader i mean it's a, it's a question we don't we can't Wait, i'm telling you and i have heard passionate arguments from rabbis and commentators and you can read it also in all the classic commentators it's uh the jury's <laughs> out <laughs> people people see that in different ways anyway he, okay, i mean he, he, appo yeah. he appointed he appointed people like Moses and Abraham. So, I mean, he appointed leaders in that sense. But not as kings. And that's, not as, not that's as kings, no. Difference. What is a king? A king, one of the most fundamental uh, characteristics of a king is that the rule passes down to his son. Hmm. And that becomes problematic as it is. I mean, and this is also something that's giving us right away. We had Eli as a leader, sons are no good. Samuel is a leader, sons are no good. Okay, we're now going to appoint Saul. Well, his son is actually okay. He's not so good, that's all. David, wonderful. I mean, he's not perfect, but he's wonderful. But look what happens after he dies. Solomon, wonderful. Look what happens after he dies. You know, and then, of course, in, in, in the kingdom of Judah, all the kings are, are father, son, father, son. They're all from the house of David, okay? Some are good and some are not. And then in the house of Israel, ha. <laughs> you know, bloody over, overthrows and, 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 you know, suddenly you have a dynasty, then you have another dynasty. I mean, you know, so that's a problem with kings. It's a problem. But on the other hand, it was the only system of rule known in the ancient world. That's also something that has to be taken to account. You know, are people ready for a whole different way of rule? Maybe it would have been better if they just had these periodical leaders for particular situations and then really understood that their ultimate leader is God. But the question is, is that practical? Are human beings ready for that kind of situation? Mm -hmm. Are we ready today for that situation? Look how many people, we have so many issues and even the people of faith and we, we, we pray and we turn to faith, but we always feel we want a man of God or a woman of God to lead us. 
we do feel we need a human being who's going to kind of, you know, put the system together. We're often disappointed. <laughs> All right. Because, anyway, because, great discussion. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank You're you, welcome. Sandra. Yeah, okay, we'll you. see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that film. And we have lots more film content and emails and articles that I'm sure you will enjoy as well. Check out our website at cfoic.com and subscribe to our newsletter. You can do that right from the homepage. I know you will really enjoy the content that will land in your inbox on a regular basis. Hope to see you soon.